an email. So all the past lectures you can see. <coughs> now, without further ado, <coughs> let's zip right along to Tunisia since 1956. Authoritarianism in the sun. Um, I know I asked the question earlier, but now everybody's here. Um, show of hands, please. How many people have been to Tunisia? One, two, two. Any advance on two? Two it is. For people who are based in Europe, it's always been a very popular holiday destination. Um, you know, it's 80 miles from Sicily. So there is a, a real sense in which it's almost part of Europe, but the southern bit of Europe. You know, I think when you look at the Mediterranean, that wine-dark sea of Homer's, <clears throat> there has never really been a north and a south with a clear line between the two. Southern Europe and northern Africa are just neighbours on the Mediterranean. And I think that's a very interesting idea to have in your heads as we go through this, this whole course. So, our outline. Tunisia 1956, what did the country look like in independence? Then parts one, two, three. Bourguiba, President the First. Ben Ali, President the Second. And then his decline and fall. And we will conclude with the situation in Tunisia today. So, Tunisia in 1956. Again, nice to place it on a map for people. I'll stand out of shot for a second. What's the most obvious thing about Tunisia and its geography? Just looking at this slide. It looks like Albania, actually. Does it look like inverse Albania? Okay, well, I didn't just thought that. Yes, it does. And a bit bigger. But, yeah. Yes. Um, it's much smaller compared to its other North It's much smaller. That's a very important point. It's much smaller than Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Morocco. Anything else? Northernmost. Hmm? It's the northernmost. Northernmost, yeah. Closest. Um, the northernmost. I was going to say the closest to Europe, but that's not strictly true, is it? As the Strait of Gibraltar there is only well, nine, less than nine miles across. But yeah, it's, it's the northernmost. It's the smallest. It's also sort of smack in the centre of North Africa, pretty much. Those borders have been there for a good while. Slightly larger than Florida, again, for people who know their American states. Um, I'm learning them, uh, slowly. Um, and it's also slightly larger than the country of Greece. So. Two neighbours, Algeria and Libya, and those are the borders. Since the start of the Arab uprisings, these borders have been very important. Um, we are all journeying across North Africa at the moment, and our journey started in Egypt, has taken us thus far across Libya to Tunisia, and next week Algeria on to Morocco. There are many people in the world who are equally interested today in looking at North Africa as a unit, as a region of interest, because of the fallout from the so-called Arab Spring, and Tunisia is often seen as a sort of soft underbelly of this. If you know anything about modern history of North Africa, you will look at the friendly states, in inverted commas, and the less friendly states. Those which we think of as okay for us in the West, and those that are less so. If you imagine those countries in North Africa, again the five, we have Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco. It's not a mnemonic which is encouraged or, or a way of looking at the region which is encouraged by um, anybody in government. But essentially, people often look at these countries as Egypt, tourist. Libya, terrorist. Tunisia, tourist. Algeria, terrorist. Morocco, tourist. There's a good, bad, good, bad, good. That was the kind of general overarching... What's North Africa about? Well, since the Arab awakening, the Arab uprising, the Arab spring, there's been a lot more trouble in places like southern Tunisia since the degree of security has broken down on the borders. And a lot of those weapons that have escaped from uh, Libya are making their way to Algeria via Tunisia because Tunisia is seen as a soft touch. The security forces in Libya and Algeria prior to the Arab uprising were a lot fiercer and a lot harder to deal with. Population's just under 11 million, so small population in a relatively small area. What it doesn't have, like Libya that we mentioned last week, Libya is blessed slash cursed 
with lots and lots of oil. It was the oil that allowed Gaddafi to stay in power. It was the oil that allowed Gaddafi to play his revolutionary games with his nation and the rest of the world as he saw fit. Um, Tunisia doesn't have anything like those reserves. It has a little bit for domestic consumption. Um, but really, it's always, since the war, since the Second World War, that has relied on things like tourism and remittances from Tunisians living abroad. There have been years when tourism has been the single most important factor in the GDP for the country. And as you can imagine, with terrorist attacks and the like, that dips very quickly and disastrously for the country. This bit down here, this is a, a, a town called Tatooine. Anybody heard Tatooine? From? Star Wars. From Star Wars, right. Tatooine was a, uh, it was a planet, right, in Star Wars? George Lucas filmed a great deal of Star Wars down here. This is all Sahara. Um, the place where Luke Skywalker lives, Matmata, it's a real place. It's underground. They're troglodytes. They're people who dug down into the rock and they have these underground houses <coughs> which remain very, very cool throughout the year. And if you go to Tatooine today and all of this bit of the Sahara, you'll still see a lot of the, the sets from the filming of Star Wars are still there, preserved, and you can, there's hotels there and the bar where all those weird intergalactic people were doing their thing. It's, it's all still there without the intergalactic people in the bar, you understand? Uh, right over here is something called the Chot El Jerid. It's the world's largest salt lake, which is quite a sight. Um, big salt pans. You'll see rowboats in the middle of it in the times when it's wetter than others, and they mine or harvest the salt. Fascinating area. This is Jerba, this island, home of the lotus eaters, and that synagogue we saw in the earlier slide. But for... Our story in the centre of power, Tunis, is obviously where it's at. Very ancient, venerable city. Um, if I talk about Carthage sometimes, it, they're pretty much contiguous. <coughs> There's a couple of miles separating Tunis and Carthage. Um, and it's that city, Tunis, and this one here, Sous, the second city, which is where most of the wealth is concentrated in the country. Mohammed Bouazizi, the fruit seller who set fire to himself, he came from down here, the centre of the country, where there is no investment. Today they reckon that unemployment in Tunisia stands at about 18% overall. In land, it's around 28%. You know, that's a significant dose of unemployment. <clears throat> And all the foreigners that go to Tunisia for their holidays, they you know, want to see water. So they're on, on all these coastal places like Nabil here, um, and Hamamet <coughs> is a resort just down here. But yeah, the interior of the country is in, in some trouble. So, um, the very briefest bits of background history. Um, these are not digressions. These are very important for understanding Tunisian independence. So, listen up. Don't be put off by the 18 in front of the 78. It was still important. Can anybody tell me what happened at the Congress of Berlin? Bismarck and friends. Yes, Bismarck, very good. And the other <coughs> major powers in Europe at the Congress of Berlin in 1878 decided how they would divide Africa. It was very amicable. Um, well, it would be because they came to a gentleman's agreement as to what to do with somebody else's continent. Uh, one of the things that was settled was that Tunisia, here, we've had this slide before when we looked at Libya and uh, what Mussolini called Italy's fourth shore. <coughs> so the late 19th century, Bismarck, the British, the French, the Italians were present too. They were basically meeting to decide how to divide up Africa. Um, and then from that, of course, we have the famous or infamous scramble for Africa. At that time, the Italian population <coughs> in Tunisia outnumbered the French population by a factor of 15 to 1. And yet Tunisia was given to the French. There's a very good reason. Because Cyprus had just been given to the British. You see how these look like tangents, but it's all tied up with diplomatic finagling. 
The British decided that because France hadn't objected to their being awarded Cyprus, they wouldn't object to Tunisia being awarded France, and the Italians would have to go and whistle. So Tunisia was offered to the French, but the French didn't do anything with this offer of Tunisia, this very kind offer of their fellow Europeans to have Tunisia as your own. It's part of the Ottoman Empire, don't forget, but the Ottoman Empire hadn't had any real power in Tunisia at this stage for 200 years. This is when the French really get involved in Tunisia, the Treaty of Bardo in 1881. If anybody does travel to Tunisia, Bardo is a place, it is a suburb of Tunis, it's also a palace, the Bardo Palace. And it was in this palace that the Bey, B-E-Y, the Bey of Tunis, not to be confused with the B-A-Y, Bey of Tunis, signed an agreement with the French. Essentially, the French allowed Tunis to remain independent, but it became a protectorate. There is a very important distinction for those who rule foreign countries, and that is that the French had all the power, but essentially none of the responsibility. So France, after the Treaty of Bardo, had complete control over defence and foreign affairs, but the Bey could do his best to rule the country um, with the French advice uh, inside his borders. That's what you'll see in the Bardo Palace today, the world's, perhaps the world's greatest collection of Roman mosaics. There are hundreds of them. Again, we think of North Africa, we maybe forget the Roman influence. It was tremendous. And those borders for Tunisia we looked at earlier have been there since before the Romans came, with a few minor changes. I mention that simply because it's important to understand that Tunisians not only know their history, but they know it's a very, very ancient history. <coughs> Probably Egypt is the only country in the region that has a longer, unbroken line of tradition that people point to and say, ah, that's when we were Egyptians. Tunisia. Tunisian. Hmm. Tunisia was inspired by the example of Libya at this time. Remember the Libyan flag? The must-try-harder John flag? The pure green well, this, was, this is the flag of the Beylik of Tunis. When I say that Libya inspired the Tunisians, it wasn't in flag design, as you can uh, readily tell. It's quite remarkable, and I, I've yet to disentangle the various elements and quite how it was put together. But it's, it was around since 1705. You know, in many ways, it looks quite modern with these sort of stuffed olives and things, that, uh, and the stars and the, the, the two-pointed flail or sword here. But it was in 1705 that the Bey of Tunis essentially said to the Ottomans, I'm taking over the country. Now, it remained part of the Ottoman Empire, but from 1705 until 1881, the signing of the Treaty at Bardo, the Bey of Tunis replaced the Dey, D-E-Y, of Constantinople. I'm sorry about all these homonyms, but they, they, uh, they're important to get the spellings right. What this meant was that Tunisia was an independent country, but still stamped its money with the name of the ruler, the day of Constantinople, and at Friday prayers in the mosque, praise was still given to the sultan in Constantinople. With this lip service and a small annual tribute, Tunisia was able to, to rule its own affairs. This was a problem then when it came to the French invading in 1881, because they didn't have the support of a larger um, Ottoman army to back them up. Tunis was inspired by Libya, not by its flags, but by independence. You remember the story of Libya? How the United Nations decided they'd put these three Ottoman provinces, or Viliet, together and make a new country. And it was declared fully independent in 1951. Well, in 1951, Tunisia was still very much under French control. 1942 and 43. Tunisia had been very much under German control in the middle of the Second World War. The Germans are gone, the war is finished. Tunisia and other countries of Africa and the Middle East are looking for independence, some of them not having any success whatsoever, and then their neighbours, Libya, is handed it on a plate, seemingly without any struggle at all, although, as we saw, the uh, War of Resistance took place earlier from 1911 and the Italian invasion for 20 years till 1931. In Tunisia, the people thought they should get the same thing. I don't know if anybody knows this writer, who is still with us, born in 1920, Albert Memmi. 
he writes, uh, I should point out that the italics haven't come across. This, <laughs> when you see this word written down in texts of North Africa, it is colon. It is French for settler. It is not talking about colons. So if the colon living standards are high, it is because those of the colonized are low. Tunisia is often seen as a rather soft example of colonialism in North Africa. It wasn't that bad, is the view we can be offered, versus perhaps Libya, where they had this 20-year war, or Egypt, where the uh, penetration and control of the country was much greater. Albert Memmi is an example of that uh, Jewish Tunisian population. He left Tunisia quite young in life and moved to France, where he did most of his writing. And this line of his comes from a book called The Colonizer and the Colonized. It's a very good text, which I would urge you to read when time permits. The living standards of Tunisians were pretty low under French occupation. And I call it occupation. Legally, it wasn't. It was the protector. I've already mentioned that. <coughs> but the French got all the best land, and the Italians and other foreigners who were there. The Tunisians had to make do. The French were also those most educated in the country. Their children went to the good schools the Tunisians didn't. So we come to independence. And it's important to know what happens on independence. And the first president, Morgiba. You notice the dates here, 1957 to 1987. What year did Tunisia get independence? 56. So was there a president before Morgiba? No. They had a bay. And again, I'm not talking about the Bay of Tunis here. Um, oh, here's the Chot el Jerid, this great salt pan that exists, and, and Jerba down here. <coughs> when Tunisia gained independence, they didn't have a president. They were still under the control of a bay, at least for the first year, between 1956 and 1957. And here he is, Mohammed al-Amin, the last bay of Tunis. So much more colourful, these bays. This is the chap whose flag was that rather ornate thing we saw earlier. You can see the inspiration for colours that uh, reflects in his costume. He had a life in exile um, after he was ousted, when Bourguiba took over and the country became an independent republican state. And this is the rather simpler flag that they adopted, very much like the Turkish flag, except with the um, sickle moon and the star in white on the Turkish flag against a red background. What's important about that flag while we're on it? It's Islamic. Good. Why is it Islamic? Because it has the crescent moon and the star. It's also the flag of... The Ottoman Empire. It's very interesting that they get independence from the Ottomans, or they had been nominally independent for some, several hundred years. The French come in in 1881. When they get independence fully, they revert to an Ottoman era flag. Again, the Ottomans are foreign, don't forget. They're Turks. They're Turkic speaking, non Arabic speaking. It's very interesting that Tunisians revert to take this older flag. And here is Bourguiba returning to lead the Neo Destour party. Um, it's difficult with foreign terms sometimes to get the spellings right. I like, I think Dostor is the most authentic or most accurate spelling, but you will also see it D-E-S-T-E-U-R and all sorts of other variants. So um, if you don't find something very often, just have a quick think that what does it look like in Arabic or French? You can always do Google Translate, um, and I think that will break down individual letters for you. Borgiba, man of the people, very popular. Another, another Ottoman symbol on his head, the fez, was very popular. Interesting, across North Africa generally, um, we don't have time to look at it in detail, but you will see periods when fezes were banned in certain countries, and then periods where they were compulsory. Um, fez manufacturers' fortunes went up and down, like the Assyrian Empire. Um, so Habib Bogiba, dates 1903 to 2000, lived to a ripe old age. After he fell from power, or was ousted, as we'll see later, he retired to his home city of Monastir, which is on the coast, not far from Sousse. But let's look at his 30-year um, reign. 
the store to near the store. This, this is important. I don't suppose any of you knew these political parties before you, this week's readings, but now you're all intimately familiar with them, yes? Bravo. Um, the word Hizb just means party in Arabic. It's useful for all African and Middle Eastern lectures where you're talking about politics. Al-Hizb is the party. So Hezbollah, that organization is the party of God. That's literally what it means. So, the Stoa Party, founded in 1920 to start pushing for independence in Tunisia, it was the Constitutional Liberal Party. That's what the name translates as. Bourguiba fell out with Dostor. Dostor wanted to eradicate all reference to France, to the French history. Once they got independence, they said, that's it. Deal's over. We don't want to know anything about the French. Bourguiba took a more pragmatic line and said that while he wanted to get rid of the French overlords as soon as possible... He recognized that you can't just eradicate your history, and French occupation or the protectorate was part of their history. So, being a man of, of um, great ambition and un, unlimited, I suppose, enthusiasm for himself, Borghiba went off and founded his own party after he'd been expelled from Dostor, and he called it Neo Dostor, which is um, neat. The new constitutional liberal party, founded in 1934. So, references to Neo Dostor. Bourguiba was in both. He went from one and founded the other. What's important, what's important in an independent struggle is the idea of your nation. It didn't happen in Libya, but it did happen in Egypt. We'll see that it was very important in Algeria and less so in Morocco because of the particular circumstances in each of those countries. But in Libya, the struggle for independence wasn't as hard fought, shall we say, because there wasn't the sense of nationhood. <coughs> I've mentioned that the borders of Tunisia have been in place for more than 2,000 years, with a few moves here and there, minor moves. So the country could quite easily get behind the idea of what it was to be a Tunisian. And what it was, was not being French. So it's very easy to unite behind an idea that we want our independence. Great. Nationalism wins out. They get independence. There is pride in being independent, but there are associated problems with this too. Anybody want to hazard a guess? Some pretty serious problems, right? You've got independence. We've seen this time and time again, both with struggles for independence and the struggles most recently with the Arab awakenings. It's very easy to get rid of Mubarak, it seems, in 18 days, when you have millions of people standing in Medan Tahrir and across the country in Suez and Alexandria saying, go, he left. What happens then on day one after Mubarak's departure? <coughs> this united front falls apart into all of its disparate, very, very disparate identities. The same is true in Tunisia upon independence. The only thing that united the nationalists was a hatred, if that's not too strong a word, of the French, or at least a strong desire to get rid of the French and to be independent. They get that. Then all the French leave. Now, do you remember we said how important the French were to run the country? They were the civil servants, they were the educated class, they were the ones with the best land, they were the ones with the most experience of farming, at least on a large scale. The Tunisian peasant farmers had small holdings that could feed their families, but was never going to be productive in a national sense. So, not every single Frenchman and woman left in, uh, upon independence, but enough of them left to put the country into very dire economic straits. With an attendant decline in investment, nobody wants to invest from Europe in a newly independent North African nation which has just chased off all the foreigners. It doesn't set a good precedent. You think, well, wait a minute, how do I know I'm not going to be chased off if I invest there? So there was no investment in the country. Inevitably, massive rise in unemployment, and the political disunity that I've already referred to. So what are the solutions? As I said, Bourguiba was a man with enormous, unbridled chutzpah. He believed he could do anything. He also believed that he didn't have to consult with the population because he believed so much in his destiny as president of Tunisia that he knew what was best for the country. He didn't have to go to the people. There was no need to have elections, particularly because he was now the father of Tunisia. 
He set out on a very, very ambitious reform program that has seen him, Borghiba, likened to Mustafa Kemal, also known as Kemal Ataturk in Turkey, whose reforms in the 1920s upon the independence of Turkey and the end of the Ottoman Empire um, set him apart as a unique character in Turkish history. Borghiba had the same vision for himself. And if anybody wants to know what Ataturk looks like, just drive up Massachusetts Avenue and you'll see the Turkish embassy on your right-hand side just before the Islamic Center and Mosque. And there's a big statue of Ataturk standing outside it. Borghiba's reputation suffered later in life, so he never really had the adulation that Ataturk still enjoys in Turkey today, where it's a crime to speak ill of Ataturk. The same is not true in Tunisia of Borghiba. Borghiba went for foreign loans. He knew he couldn't develop the country quick enough, so he borrowed. He borrowed very heavily. But with those loans came interest repayments, which saw the country um, go into deeper and deeper debt. Massive debt. We'll see later quite how bad it was. He also understood that in the 1960s, we're talking about now, it was a good time for the development of tourism. In Europe, people were recovering. The nations of Europe had recovered from the Second World War. There was money to be spent. Europe's very close. You start building tourist resorts. It's easy money. You can employ lots of people to work in tourism without training them a great deal. Um, as many people have experienced if you try and get good service. It's very easy to work in tourism, but not always the five-star service. So anyway, this was Tunisia in the 60s. 1957, I think, perhaps the most important thing, and most lasting, perhaps, of all Borghiba's legacies, was the personal status code. This was actually drawn up in 1956, when there was still a bay in place, but it was only brought into being in 1957 by Borghiba, within weeks of his coming to power. The personal status code is still talked about today, and there are still battles fought in Tunisia to this day about how much of it to keep, or what bits to get rid of, or how to improve on it. Now, most of the discussion today is about the between the socially conservative wing of the country, the radical Islamists, the Salafists, who want to see aspects of the personal status code removed. Because this code gave full equal rights to women. In 1957, Tunisia became the first country in the Arab world to give women the vote. It also made universal education for men and women, uh, saw that put on an equal footing. Borghiba understood that you can't have half your population, i.e. females, not working, not part of the workforce, not empowered. So in that regard, he was quite revolutionary for the region, for his time. Uh, and it's interesting that these are some of the debates which are going on today, whether there's too much liberty given to women in Tunisia and other countries. After 1957, through the 60s and 70s, there was an Islamist opposition. But the Islamist parties that opposed Bourguiba and opposed the personal status code were never allowed to form political parties. They had social networks, for sure, like the Muslim Brotherhood did in Egypt. But because they were never allowed to make political parties, because it was illegal to have a political party that wasn't Borghiba's party, it's a very neat way of doing things, it meant that the Islamists, while they had a voice, they never really had any power. And one of the Islamist objections to the personal status code was that with so many women being educated and coming into the workforce, it increased unemployment among ill-educated men. This they saw as a problem. And Borghiba's relationship with Islam, at least with public Islam, as we'll call it, was fraught from day one. We talked about the personal status code, but it went much further. Borghiba, after all, was educated in France, at least his higher education. It was when he was an uh, undergraduate in Paris that he met his wife-to-be, who was his landlady. Um, sounds like a sort of bad sitcom or a romantic comedy, but yes, he fell in love with and married his uh, French landlady, and they came back to Tunisia to live, and he became president at the end. He was liberal-minded, at least in so far as the personal status code and the rights of women. He was not liberal-minded when it came to other political parties. He was the absolute ruler of Tunisia as far as possible. Economic challenges. I mentioned the um, unemployment among the population and also the problem then of empowering women to get jobs and there not being enough jobs for them. Borghiba had no sympathy 
Which was a pity, because Islam in Tunisia was generally a more moderate force than that Islam one would find in Saudi Arabia. It didn't have the same radicalism. But the further you push somebody into a corner, you can be pretty sure the more radical they will become. We'll come across a character called Rashid Kanuchi, who I'm sure most of you have heard of recently, because he's very important in Tunisian politics today. But there came a point when they were invited to take part in elections, and then they were disallowed from standing. Then there came a point where the Islamist <coughs> party said, OK, that's it. If you don't allow participation through ballot box, then we're going to turn to violence. This was the only excuse Bourguiba needed to have a, a crackdown on the Islamist groups, the threat of violence. Uh, the historians are divided as to how serious a threat it was, how organized they were, or how many of the Islamists were willing to engage in violence. It's a moot point, because Bourguiba came, came down on them very heavily. Um, this picture here of the, the mosque of Uqba. Uh, Uqba was an um, Islamic general from the 7th century. Uqba bin Nafi, he was known as the conqueror of Africa. And when he came through, he established a mosque in Kairouan, which is on this site. It's one of the oldest extant um, mosques in the world. And Kairouan was the center of Islam for Africa, as was understood at the time, that is, Saharan and Sahelian Africa, for hundreds of years. Of the four major schools of Islamic legal thought, two of them have their origins in North Africa, and one of them from this place, Cairo 1. Um, the H here is Hijra, the Hijra or Islamic calendar, Hijra year 50, when this mosque was established, 670 in the Common Era, or Anno Domini. Cairo 1, most of you have seen, if not in person, because um, it was used as the setting for that memorable scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where Indiana Jones is confronted by um, a man waving a sword and he pulls out his pistol. That whole chase scene is filmed in Cairo 1. It's still got very, lots of sort of winding old-fashioned streets and, and, and marketplaces, so it's still very popular with filmmakers. Again, this is, I mention it not just because it's amusing to think of Indiana Jones in, in um, Tunisia, or indeed Star Wars in Tunisia, but because this was one of the things which the people, uh, Borghiba and, and Ben Ali after him developed, was a, was a friendly face to the world. They made things like filming very easy, it's very difficult to make a film in Egypt. It was and it still is. There are so many restrictions on what you can film and what you can't film. Tunisia opened up to foreigners. This opening up to foreigners, though, again, riled perhaps uh, certain wings of the Islamic um, non-political parties who were trying to get better, more... Uh, I suppose a better representation for their view in the country when it was not being allowed. I mean, this is, this is quite inflammatory language. Bourguiba time and time again used this phrase in his speeches about the veil. An odious rag was how he referred to it. I mean, you can imagine if somebody referred to uh, the veil today in the public arena as an odious rag, what sort of reception they might receive. Well, this was, this was you know, Bourguiba's common expression for it. He didn't want women veiled. Um, in Turkey, you might know, it's, it's, it's banned. You're not allowed to wear the veil in public buildings so that even the president of Turkey, whose wife chooses to wear the veil, isn't allowed into parliament if she wears the veil. Um, just an interesting aside. Was that not held or did they were, uh, In Turkey? I think it's still in place, as far as I know, because now there's an Islamist political party, and you mean. I don't know, has well, it been? They, there was like a lawsuit against the universities, at least. Right. In public places. I'm not sure what the result was. I, I, don't, I don't think it was overturned, but we can look into that. So this man who we've seen a lot more of recently, Rashid al Qanushi, found something called the Islamic Tendency Movement. You'll see it referred to as MTI by its French acronym, where letters tend to get reversed from the English, and thus the right way of saying it. I'm joking, of course. Um, this is him in 1981, or 1980-81. I couldn't find the exact date, but he's in Europe at this time. He was found the, founded the party. This is a speech he made in, in uh, Europe. The party wasn't forced underground so much, it's just never allowed in. It was never given a seat at the table. They didn't get the opportunity to take part in elections. Anything with Islamic in the title wasn't allowed to form a political party. So he founded another political party and called it... Huh? 
Right, Ennahda, the party we know today, which means Renaissance, um, which is, in French, Renaissance. Um, so he founds the Renaissance Party, which allows them to take part. They would field independence for elections rather than saying uh, we're Islamists. The same thing took place in Egypt over many years where Muslim Brotherhood candidates were not allowed to stand, so they stood as independents. How about this for a quick summation of Bourguiba's economic roller coaster? 1960s, Bourguiba's party, Neo de Store, renamed itself, adding the word socialist. Everything in the 60s was about socialism. There was centralization, there was greater control. It failed, ultimately. I think it failed, one reason it failed, at least was because Bourguiba had grand ideas, but was never very flexible. Again, when he didn't listen to the people or didn't try and get other people's opinions, it's very easy to believe in yourself absolutely, even when all the evidence is against you. So by the 70s, he was persuaded that maybe this hard-line socialist approach wasn't working, so he went for liberalism, and he went all out for liberalism. And what do you know? It didn't work. It went too far too quickly. He didn't take into consideration the local circumstances, which were, of course, the result of his policy in the 60s. In the 1980s, the failure of both. There was a big problem in Tunisia with debt, as we mentioned earlier. And the IMF and the World Bank came in, um, some would say to the rescue. Others would have a very different view of this. The IMF and the World Bank said, look, we can provide you with more loans, additional loans, bigger loans to help you out of this problem. Some people have likened them to loan sharks, where we can take all of your debts and you can just have one debt to us at these terms. And one of the terms was the removal of subsidies on staples like flour. Do you remember back to Egypt, 1977, the so-called bread riots in Cairo? Because again, the IMF and World Bank had said, we can give you loans, but you have to get rid of the subsidies. So overnight, price of bread doubles. People start starving. And a few pennies was the difference between living on cheap staple foods and starving, not being able to feed your family. This happened in Tunisia in 1978. Black Thursday, a Thursday in January 1978 when there were riots. Um, Borghiba's car was stoned, which was an unprecedented shake-up and a scare for him that people would actually attack the person of the president. 1983, there were more negotiations with the IMF and the World Bank. And again, they said, you've got to get rid of subsidies. And Borghiba thought, well, hey, I tried that once. Didn't go down so well. I remember being stoned <coughs> in my car. So what they did in 1983 was he lifted the subsidies and tried to avoid the trouble by uh, how? Uh, he diminished the amount of like, bread or whatever. Right. You make a loaf of bread smaller, so you don't have to increase the price. There's just less product for your money. Um, I don't think it's limited Tunis to Tunisia. I'm sure that Mars bars were bigger when I was a kid, that maybe my hands were just smaller. But it, yeah, there's one way of doing it. So your customers don't see any difference in price. They think, oh, that's good. But very soon Tunisians realize that their tummies weren't full because they weren't putting as much bread in as they had been a week before. 1986 debt. Tunisian debt is 60% of GDP. I mean, it's, it's high. It's, it's a problem. And Bourguiba has no answers. Do you remember when he was born? 1903. He's, he's getting on now, you know, and I don't care how sharp you are. He's been politically active at the top of the country, ruling everything, uh, may, maybe with an iron hand and an iron fist and a velvet glove. But even so, the man is tired. His faculties are also failing. He's had several heart attacks. He's had other bouts of uh, weakness, as it was called in, in um, the foreign press. He goes overseas for medical treatment. He comes back, he bounces back. He's like a new man, revived. But he's losing a grip, essentially. And here he is, in all his regalia. Not quite as much regalia as the bays before him wore, but even so, pretty impressive badges of office here. But it's 1986, runs into 1987, and it's time somebody decides for Bourguiba to go. And the man who decides he should go is Ben Ali. Um, if change is a good thing in politics, then Ali decides to keep the costume. There's very little change at the top, initially. 
That is in, in policy terms. Ben Ali was made Prime Minister of Tunisia just a month before he gets rid of Bourguiba. That's your reward. He had been removed on medical grounds that basically Bourguiba wasn't fit to run the country anymore because he was mentally um, and physically incapable. Well, we know what happens to Ben Ali. We haven't seen the end of the story yet, perhaps. But because Ben Ali took power in a bloodless coup, he made reference to, if it's not officially the national flower of, of Tunisia, it's at least the one that you smell most in the spring, and the one that is commonly woven into these um, tightly bound uh, bouquets. It is, of course, jasmine. So Ben Ali takes power and declares it a jasmine revolution which is why Tunisians today are not terribly keen on their revolution being called the Jasmine Revolution. Um, again, it's another important um, historical tidbit to be aware of when you go to Tunisia and start telling them how great their Jasmine Revolution was. You might not get the uh, reaction that you're expecting. This is Jasmine tied up in little bundles. The, the, um, the buds haven't yet come out. But you could be sitting in a bar in Tunisia and somebody will come around with a basket of this and you, 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 you know, buy it for... Uh, I don't know, probably five, six cents. Um, and you put it in your buttonhole and it smells really nice because there's, there's a great deal of smoking still goes on in Tunisian bars and anything to help get through the smell of the smoke is very welcome indeed. So, time for change. It's time, 1987. You would think, perhaps, if Ben Ali was so unhappy with Bourguiba, to change things completely, to have political inclusion, economic revision, and a more regional outlook. Try and get some more expertise in. Ben Ali does none of these things. If anything, he has a tighter grip on the country, politically. Um, there's nothing like somebody who's led a coup or a putsch to know how easy it is to lose power, because you've just put it into effect with a, a signing away with several doctors saying that the old president should go. There was a period here when people like um, Granouchi was let out of prison. He'd been sentenced to death by Bourguiba. And then Ben Ali persuaded him to revert the death penalty and just keep him in prison for a bit. Ben Ali comes in, takes power, releases a number of Islamists, uh, many of whom, um, Rashid Ghanoushi among them, decides to go into voluntary exile. He doesn't like the way things are going in Tunisia. He doesn't believe that the Islamist parties will ever get a fair chance at taking part in national politics. So a lot of them lead. Um, the Anahda party leadership was all overseas for about 20 years. It's also very interesting in terms of the Tunisian Revolution that the leadership was all overseas, in, in England and in France primarily. There was a period of very strong economic growth in Tunisia. This thing here is the, uh, called the Africa Hotel. And this is Avenue Bourguiba, right through the centre of modern Tunis. It's about the only thing left with uh, Bourguiba's name on it. Right here, can you see this is a clock? It's quite beautiful, made of iron. There used to be a statue of Bourguiba there, but when Ben Ali came in, he decided that this equestrian statue should be moved, and it was shifted to roughly over here, a place called La Golette. There's a lake here, and then the Mediterranean beyond it. The economic growth in Tunisia, though, was based very much, as we said earlier, on... Things like tourism. So we have economic growth, but we still have rising unemployment. Um, the, the sign here is pointing to <coughs> Cairo, Tripoli. And that's the border, by the way. That border with uh, Libya has been closed for several weeks over Christmas and New Year, reopened. And there were gun battles with Islamists killing Tunisian border guards, smugglers, arms, arms dealers. Um, it's all going on on that Libyan-Tunisian border, um, and still, uh, it's a problem. But it was to Libya and to Cairo that many Tunisians went for work. Libya had the oil industry, don't forget, and they needed lots of unskilled labour. That was perfect for the ill-educated Tunisians. And then, of course, there was this problem of terrorism. We're back in that synagogue again. These are tourists. This synagogue, as I mentioned, in Jerba... 2002, it was attacked, that is, bombed by Al-Qaeda. Um, again, we think of Tunisia as being this sort of sunshine holiday destination, but the bomb attack outside this synagogue 
I mean, the pop- Jewish population in Tunisia is around about 1,500 today. It's you know not an existential threat to anybody's um, faith system, I would not think. But the bomb attack killed 21 people, uh, 14 of whom I think were German tourists, and there were two or three French tourists killed, and the rest were locals, Tunisians. It only takes one bomb like that, as you see in places like um, Egypt with the 1997 attacks at uh, Luxor, to cripple a national economy. So much of it depends on foreigners coming on a regular basis. A number of tourists, an increasing number of tourists, did come from places like Libya and Algeria to Tunisia. If you're Libyan, at least I must check this, before the uprising, Libyans didn't have to get visas. I've crossed that border with Libya to Tunisia, and the Libyans show a passport and walk through. I don't know that that's still the case today. Probably not. But North Africans don't have as much money as Europeans and Americans. So it's American and European tourists they wanted, not really the North Africans. To the decline and fall. Bourguiba had declared himself, or rather... Bourguiba had, Bourguiba's party had declared him president for life. Ben, it's not a bad post, is it? If that's what you want. Ben Ali said he would never do this. But re-election after re-election saw him winning with 100% of the vote. It did drop when they allowed opposition parties to stand in the 90s. There was one memorable occasion when Ben Ali only received 94.5% of the vote, which was you know, a disastrous defeat, as you can imagine. Um, but don't worry, he soon had those opposition leaders rounded up and imprisoned. Um, that's what you get for um, an open voting system. This woman's very important, Leila Trabelsi. This is Ben Ali's wife. She tended to stick with her maiden name, Trabelsi. And in fact, when I was living in Tunis, my landlord was a Trabelsi. Um, I never, I never asked Monsieur and Madame Trebelsi if they were related to the Trebelsis, because it would seem a little impolite. She was never loved by the Tunisian people. She was a, a hairdresser. Um, I don't know where they met, but people always mocked her for being a um, low-class, ill-bred hairdresser, now married to the president. She's important not because people didn't like her, but for the reasons they didn't like her. She had quite a large family, and Ben Ali inevitably had an extended family. Between them, they were very, very corrupt. Simple as that. This figure here, 40% of the GDP, in the hands of Ben Ali Trebelsi extended family connections. This is not a figure which I have made up. It's not a figure, equally, that's terribly easy to verify. But it's a figure which has been produced by um, a collection of bankers and economists, Tunisians and foreign alike, who have, since the ouster of Ben Ali, looked at the various businesses they owned. And they owned an awful lot of businesses. And this is the figure that the the best, brightest um, Tunisian economists have come up with. That between them, over decades, they had amassed controlling interests in enough business to have just less than half the country's GDP in their hands. Um, you may have heard stories when they were ousted that Le- Leila Trebelsi had gone to the central bank and taken out a lot of gold bars and flown away with them. It, it's been said that that wasn't the case. The central bank said she didn't leave with any gold. So that's good. Um, but there was plenty of other stuff that they did have. And, and she was known for having a, a fondness for Paris which is unfortunate when you're forced into exile in Saudi Arabia, because um, there's not much in the Saudi Arabian city of Abha, where they are now living, that resembles Paris in any way, shape, or form. Um, This was an interesting book, The Regent of Carthage. It's about um, Leila Trebelsi and uh, Ben Ali, of course. And it was an expose from 2009. This didn't topple the first family of Tunisia, But it certainly exposed their corruption to the world at large. It's a French publication. Um, It didn't find a local publisher, funnily enough. Um, And this book, along with the WikiLeaks cables, which were devastating about Ben Ali, 
because it was the American ambassador. Ambassadors. There was more than more than one American ambassador had written about him in, in rather disparaging terms, saying that you know he was a bit of an oaf, um, that he was corrupt, that people hated him. I mean, all the stuff that proved to be true, as it happens. But you don't like these leaks coming out, and it was <coughs> it was meat and bread to the Tunisian public. But see, even your closest allies, your the the allies you rely on for money, don't like you. And there's a direct link between Trebelsi and Mohamed Bouazizi, I suppose, insofar as the corruption in Tunisia was so endemic that Mohamed Bouazizi, as hard as he worked selling his fruit in the town of Sidi Bouzid in central Tunisia, didn't have any wasta. Wasta? Hmm? Connections, thank you. Wasta, W-A-S-T-A. Connections or influence. They say this is how things happen in the Middle East. You need Wasta. You need a godfather. You need somebody that you can approach and say, I'd really like you know, my boy to get a job or I need, I need help with a loan. And these important people will sign the paperwork or not even bother with the paperwork. You're fine. On you go. Most people don't have it. And it was because they didn't have this and there was no simple, honest system for getting on that Mohamed Bouazizi set fire to himself in December 2010. Um, the rather unfortunate choice of metaphor, but the spark that started the Arab uprisings. He was one of those 28% unemployed, essentially. He was registered unemployed, didn't have a permit to sell his fruit, but worked hard every day to sell apples, oranges, whatever. So back briefly to Rashid al Ghanoushi. You remember him? Still with me? Back in 1981. And today. So, co-founds Hezbollah and Nahda. We, we drop the party of, generally, when we talk about Nahda, just the, the, way it's, the way it's gone. So, Renaissance in 1989. The important thing, as I mentioned earlier, was that it's lost the word Islamic, although it's still very much an Islamic party, but by dropping the word Islam or any reference to religion the party was allowed to exist in Tunisia. So this is where we find ourselves today. He's still the spiritual leader. He was welcomed back to Tunisia in a similar way um, that the Ayatollah was in 1979 when he came back to Iran. I'm talking about the reception here, not the people. Don't, don't, uh, I'm not conflating the two. They're very different people. This man is the president of Tunisia until at least June of this year. Monsev Marzuki. Now, why do I put him up immediately after um, al Ranoushi? Well, they were both political exiles for a while. They both spent time in prison. But Marzuki, back in the 70s and 80s, uh, he's a doctor, by the way, by profession, and a human, um, human rights activist. So back in the 70s and 80s, he worked very hard, did Ma Marzuki, to defend people who were imprisoned illegally. And whilst he's quite secular, Western educated again, he's one of the people that defended Rashid al Ghanouchi and demanded his release from prison. It's why in Tunisia today, aside from that terrible political assassination that took place last week, which is proving to be destabilizing, it's why people like Rashid Kranucci, head of the main Islamist party that got 34% of the vote in the last election, is happy to have a non-Islamist president. This is very important and it's significant for North Africa because thus far, it's the most sympathetic, shall we say, alliance between those who put Islam at the f forefront of their political opinions and those who do not see it as being central to their politics. In Tunisia today, there is a great willingness, not among everybody, of course, you never have 100% unity of uh, ideas or agreement, but in Tunisia today, you have these broad swathes, and it's because Marzuki is respected, he's always played, um, to use a cricketing metaphor, a straight bat. He's an honest man, and the Islamists know this. That could have been a good conclusion right there, actually. But we go on. 
Bogiba Ben Ali Mazuki. How many years since Tunisia gained independence? Fifty-seven. Yeah. How many presidents? Not a lot. Is our answer a fairly typical story we're seeing across North Africa? I mean, perhaps more than Libya managed um, since independence, but um, it's a familiar story unfolding about these characters who have their power. Had Bourguiba gone ten years earlier, had he just stepped down or died perhaps, I think his reputation would be as great as um, Ataturk's in Turkey today. He would have been seen as a, a reforming president, an enlightened president, who was unfortunate with certain economic failures, but hey, you know, you can't get everything right. Ben Ali, never much loved. I mean... People were fond of Bourguiba, as I say, until about the last ten years of his reign. People were never terribly fond of Ben Ali, particularly after five years into his reign, 1987, 1992, he married Leila Trabelsi. And it seems that people thought she was bad news from day one. It, just, it took against her, and that coloured their impression of the president. The repression in Tunisia was significant. Again, I, I go back to this idea that it's seen as a, a sunshine paradise, which it is for many people, but these holiday resorts have very high walls, and tourists who have two weeks holiday in the sun don't really want to get involved in local politics or understanding the nuance of a country. But I would argue that Tunisia, since independence, would be the equal, if not the most, repressive police state in North Africa. And this is just not necessarily in a numbers term of, of how many people were imprisoned or how many informers they had. See, any country in North Africa I know where before the revolution I could never get people to talk about the president. And I'm including taxi drivers in this. And if there's one breed of people on earth who like to talk, we know it's taxi drivers. You're alone, you're safe, assuming the car's not bugged. But in Tunisia, taxi drivers would never talk about Ben Ali. It was remarkable that there was that level of fear, quite simply, about talking openly to foreigners about their president, something which you know, was unheard. I mean, in, in uh, Egypt, you get into a taxi. After they ask you your religion and if you're married and how many children you have, the next thing they want to do is tell you the latest joke about Mubarak. It's, it's you know, political satire is very big in Egypt. It was not the case in Tunisia. Mazuki, as I said, well respected. He's going to be standing for re election on the 23rd of June this year. And if the country has something of a, an even keel for the next four years, I still see a very optimistic future for Tunisia with President Mazuki. Um, I think it's probably the, the best hope we have among the countries of North Africa. <coughs> Um, at this time. So with the Tunisian flag before us, I will draw this to a close, and thank you. <laughs>